We're going to first introduce Tom Sudov, who is located in Cleveland, Ohio. He's a past Federation of Jewish Men's Clubs uh, vice president. He's been our fundraising chair for the last couple of years, doing a, a great job. And uh, let's see, today he is a vice president of Team and, and Team Northeast Ohio and director of business development, a global cardiovascular innovation center. Tom has worked with many uh, Israeli companies, has presented seminars in Israel for Israeli businesses, and through the GCIC has invested in five Israel biomedical companies in the past four years. He travels to Israel for business two or three times a year and is frequently a, uh, a lecturer at Israeli businesses conferences. For his outstanding work, he has been recognized with awards from many economic development and community organizations. Without further ado, Tom Suda. So I'm going to present you with a little bit of an overview, and then we're going to get to some more specifics with uh, our other two speakers. Um, you know, when I first went to Israel about 40 years ago, you thought about Israel, you thought about you know, the, the kibbutznik with the cobalt temple on, the, the, the inverted sailor's hat, sitting on, on the tractor bouncing along, right? That was Israel. Israel was an agrarian society. Israel was a developing country. Uh, and Israel didn't have much to offer. You know, in, in my words, Israel at that point was a taker. It was, was relying on our, on our donations and on other things to, to begin to move forward. Over the last 40 years, there's been an absolute revolution in Israel. And the Israel of today is not the Israel of 40 years ago. It's also not the Israel that a number, and please don't take this the wrong way, a number of nonprofits that try to raise money for Israel paint. There is social problems in Israel, and they're, and they're substantial. But there's also tremendous wealth and tremendous investment opportunities. A couple things came together to forge this to happen. In the late 1980s and 1990s, we were successful in unlocking the doors of the Soviet Union. And a million Soviet Jews emigrated to Israel. When they arrived in Israel, they all came and said, we're engineers. We're engineers, right? And the Israelis laughed at them, uh, and they were sweeping the streets in Demona and other places in Israel. And the people began to realize these people really were engineers. And many of them had gone through many, many advanced degrees, PhDs and beyond, in, in Russia, but couldn't get jobs. They were locked out of most industries in Russia because they were Jewish, except for this, uh, the, the control, the instrument control industry. They could, they could do with the space, but they, these were highly educated people. The Israelis in 1991 launched a series of uh, incubators, business incubators, 21 of them, that they put into cities. And they took a number of these engineers and they put them in, in, in these incubators to begin to create ideas. Second, the Israeli defense forces are, when they need a product developed, they, they take the best and brightest in the Israeli defense forces and they put them in charge to develop the product. So as an example, if, when they need to build a, uh, the, the whole UAV, the, 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 the spy satellites and, and on, on unmanned aircraft, that really, a lot of that was developed in Israel. They needed a camera. They took some young scientists, put them through college, put them through uh, degrees at the Technion University, and they created a, a miniaturized camera to go into the, the wings of the, the UAV. Why is, why is this story important? Because when you leave the Israeli army, the Israeli defense forces, you can take whatever you invented with you. So you've got young people, 25 to 30 years old at that point in time, the best and the brightest, we're managing projects in the Israeli uh, Defense Forces of 20 to 30 million dollars, <coughs> managing a team of people. It sounds like they're coming, they're, they're being trained to be a CEO, much better than getting an MBA, by the way. How many of them finish and do get MBAs? And they're running the project. And when they leave, they can take the intellectual property with them. That means they can take that camera, which they did, they can take that camera and put it to any use beyond defense. And they can own, they, they, can, they can patent it and they can own it. So a guy named Gavi Marone and a few of his, of his counterparts took that camera, took their experience in running a, a, 
a, a project, and they created what's called given imaging. Given imaging is the pill cam, which went public on the, on the, the, it was the NASDAQ stock exchange uh, about a dozen years ago. Okay. In Israel, they have to be innovative. So none of the drug companies in the United States wanted to sell to Israel. First, they didn't want to upset the Arabs. World, many of the world drug companies, they want to sell in Israel in the 60s and 70s. And they don't want to upset the Arab world. And plus, they, they thought the market was too small. So they said to the Israelis, they said to a small company called Teva, if you can develop these products, put the, put the, put the medication on the market. Well, Teva developed the mechanism, and they, and they became one of the world leaders. Of, I think it's the fourth largest drug company in the area of generic drugs. So the Israelis use their innovative attitude. They use their training to, to bring products to market. So in the last six months alone, there are, there are three Israeli startups that have sold for close to a billion dollars. Uh, Waze was the most recent one a month ago that sold to Google. Was Google? I think it was Google. Google and Apple were in a, were in a bidding war over it, and they played it out very well for $1.3 billion. And every day I read a, 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 a newsletter called Globes. It's the Israel Business Journal. It's like the Wall Street Journal. And every day there's more companies being sold for 20 and 30 and 40 and $50 million. <coughs> And more, and multiples of that, 10 and 20 fold. Uh, in 2006, Warren Buffett, the, the great guru from Omaha, went to Israel and he said, some Americans have come to the, the Middle East looking for oil. We came to the Middle East looking for, for, for brains and we stopped at Israel. And they invested multiple billions of dollars in a company called Issachar, which is a metals company. Today, Israel has become a center of uh, innovation. There are more stock and the U.S. exchange is beyond, the, uh, right today, I think it's China, or China's closing and beyond, uh, beyond U.S. and Canada. On the U.S. exchanges, Israel is the next country with, 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 uh, with stocks being traded. I have a whole list, and I know we're going to get into it later, uh, page after page of Israeli technologies uh, that are traded on U.S. exchanges. And I, I mentioned some Teva and Given Imaging and others. Uh, you, you can find them, and I know we're going to have a speaker. We'll, we'll, who will talk about those directly. I want to spend some of my, some of my time talking about a, another unique opportunity. I, and I'll say very quickly, I'm not an employee of this company. I'm friends with people who work in the company. I'm fascinated by what, what they're doing. Um, anything I, I represent, Steve sitting here is, is, is our attorney, it doesn't represent the FJMC. It doesn't, it, it doesn't represent any of the organizations that I work for. It's just I'm passing aside as information. Um, there's an investor in Israel whose name is John Medved. John Medved ran a company called Israeli Seed Investments. He then ran a company called Ringo. Ringo sold to uh, this guy who owns the Dallas Mavericks, whose name is Mark Cuban, for uh, a very high multiple. John created a company in the last year called Our Crowd. Our Crowd is a crowdfunding platform for Israeli technologies. Crowdfunding is where you hear about an investment, and individual investors can then invest in, 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 it in small multiples, thousands and two thousand dollars. Uh, again, these are very high risk investments, but it's low money. Uh, John's Our Crowd, which now employs about 40 people in the last year, uh, it works only with accredited investors, which means you have to have some minimums to be able to invest in it. Uh, not what you'll invest, but you have to have some, some secured minimums. I think it's $200,000, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, you know, of, of assets to be able to participate as an accredited investor. Uh, they then do due diligence on a whole host of companies, most of them Israelis, and then by email and Twitter and, and all kinds of things, uh, they pass out to, to their, their their investment community, here are some opportunities, and here's why we think it's a good opportunity. <coughs> They've done, I think, now about 30 investments in the last year. Um, these are all very early stage investments. Uh, and most of them have strong ties to Israeli technologies. Uh, it's www.ourcrowd.com. Uh, you can look it up. And it's a way that you can dabble in an Israeli investing without you know, going in head over heels. There are a lot of people who've lost a lot of money invest investing in Israeli startups. There's also a lot of people who made a lot of money investing in Israeli startups. Um, I mentioned the incubator movement. The, there are now a number of incubators that have, that have become privatized. They're now owned by, by major companies, by investment firms, uh, to move technologies along. But that's a long and, and, and winding road. For, for the average investor, if you, if, 
we want to be involved in Israel, something like our crowd or angel investing and target investing in certain startup companies is a great way to go. Don't just invest with somebody who knocks on your door. Uh, Israelis are extremely, are very good at developing product. They're masters at developing new innovation. 40% um, of the cell phone that I carry is developed in Israel. Instant, me instant messaging developed in Israel. I mentioned the pill cam. And even here carrying a, a laptop computer, all the Intel work is done in there. Um, all the major companies in the high tech and bioscience world are in Israel regularly. I was in Israel, I, I, I'm in the bioscience world. I've been in Israel with the heads of Medtronic and uh, Boston Scientific, not traveling with me, but at conferences that they were at and speaking at. They all know about it and are all investing heavily, heavily into it. What's the fee on our crowd? Is it a two plus 20? Uh, I, I, I don't have all the details, but you, you, can, you can look it up online. I think they take a, they take a percentage. They take a, uh, their biggest percentage comes on the back end. The other thing with our crowd is they, they represent all their investors as one investment unit with the company, because the company doesn't want to be able to, to move things around. But uh, again, a lot of people in Israel have made a lot of money on, on investments. Uh, and it's from these technologies, I mentioned Intel's bought Intel, Microsoft, Warren Buffett, uh, Johnson & Johnson, Procter & Gamble. Procter & Gamble has three people who do nothing in Israel but scout for new technologies. Uh, well, I have, through Mike Mills, I had the opportunity of meeting on, on several occasions. Uh, so there's a lot of activity. It's a great place, but it's also a bit of the wild, wild west. So non-traditional funding is, I, I mentioned our crowd is in angel investing, and there's more traditional investing we're going to hear, like, like Israel bonds, and like, like investing in, in the, I think it's well over 100 stocks that are now being traded in the United States from, the, from Israel they come ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're now going to um, talk about a subject that is probably near and dear to all of us, Israel bonds. Uh, I kind of grew up with Israel bonds. It seems to be something that, that I understand. I'm going to, I'm going to, I, think, I think of it as the three Bs. From birth, you get somebody, you, usually somebody gives you an Israel bond. So we have a birth, bar mitzvah, and beyond. And we're going to introduce Ann Golub, who's located here in Boston. Uh, she's the registered representative for Israel bonds in New England. Alice is typically focusing on the ties that we have with the state of Israel as the extra motivation for investing in Israel bonds. Today she will address why Israel bonds show up in so many professionally managed portfolios. She's the, she has three grandchildren and as she told me she, she has one that is cooking and uh, she has been working for Israel bonds for 12 years. She's a New York girl who used to work in ed tech sales and is a former uh, teacher at a preschool and religious school. So she brings it all, as uh, most of our presenters do. And without further ado, Thank you. Alice. Thank you, Steve. Well, I was fortunate enough to sit in the last seminar where Joel spoke, and he spoke about long-term care. And I have another long-term care solution, and that would be Israel Bonds. Mm -hmm. Okay, now I would like to do this a little bit interactively. Raise your hand if you have ever owned an Israel Bond which is a huge percentage of groups that I speak to, pretty much 100%. We're always looking for 100% participation. Now, you're involved with your federations, um, the men's club and your synagogue. How many of your, fed your federations or your synagogues <coughs> invest in Israel bonds? So we have a little bit of a disconnect. We have people who own bonds, but not necessarily the organizations they represent. I would like to say that this morning I had a message first thing on my phone and it was from a, I was totally blown over. It was from a local synagogue. It doesn't happen to be one of the super wealthy synagogues in the Boston area. It is a synagogue that does have some endowment money. It's in a declining area, which I know probably some of you in this room are in synagogues where the Jewish population is not increasing and in fact maybe decreasing. And this fellow said, when you get back to the office, call me. Our endowment committee, our investment committee met last night and they want to invest $250,000. So I was thrilled. So my takeaway to you is our long-term care policy. Currently, we have bonds. Our 10-year $25,000 bond is paying 4.5%. That's a pretty good long-term care. Now, are our rates guaranteed? The answer is no. Nothing is guaranteed. Everything we do is backed by the full faith and credit of Israel. And as I like to tell clients, if something happens to Israel, 
we probably have a much larger issue than your bond or my bond. Um, this is not, excuse me? I'm going to say they've never defaulted. They've never defaulted, not even on a $10 interest payment. That's a pretty good track record. But again, disclaimers, we've had disclaimers all morning. I too am a licensed registered representative. I have to put disclaimers in everything. We guarantee nothing. I can just tell you in my 12 year history, we've not had a default. And more than that, in the 60, 62 year history of Israel bond, there has never been a single default. Okay, so what do we know about Israel bonds? Israel bonds are not rated, but we are actually a line item on the um, government of Israel budget. So the government of Israel is rated. What do you think the rate is, this rating is of the state of Israel? Triple A. Okay. Standard and Poor's A plus, Moody's A one, and Fitch A. So there you go. And I can tell you, when I started 12 years ago, it wasn't that high. So the Israeli economy, as we've been hearing all morning, is booming. And part of the reason that this boom has taken place, yes, all the engineers that arrived in 1989, absolutely true. But Israel was an agrarian country. Israel was founded in 1948. And what has taken the United States 230 plus, now 200, almost 240 years to achieve, going from a totally agrarian society into a nation of leaders and startups and technology, Israel accomplished in 65 years. Think about that. 65 years, when it took the United States, which is a pretty amazing nation, almost 250 years to do. And how did it happen? Back in 1951, some people got Prime Minister Ben-Gurion's ear. They needed money. Nobody was going to lend money to Israel. It just was not going to happen. You're going to give money to whom? For what? They used to go door to door. Boston was one of the four founding communities in Israel bonds and we have I have children clients who were children of the people and they said to me I remember going with my mother door to door with a can buy bonds it was modeled on the um, Uncle Sam US savings bond buy bonds for war here and they went with a can and people we have stories people would come into the offices with shopping bags full of cash $100,000 was nothing. They'd come in and they'd have to be escorted. We had to hire private guards to escort them to the bank to invest the money. As securities industry started to take over, we're all FINRA regulated and everything. Of course, we no longer accept cash and everything is regulated and everything is documented and everything is a tax event and that has all gone away. What hasn't gone away is that we've sold $35 billion worth of securities since 1951, which when you think about it from <laughs> Bar mitzvah bonds of $100 is an extraordinary amount of money. Now, I think what I picked up in the other meeting is that there's sort of this underlining presumption that there is wealth everywhere and everybody's worried about protecting his or her assets. And that could be true, but the reality is not everybody is wealthy. The reality is also that it doesn't matter when it comes to Israel bonds, because we have bonds that start at $36. We now have online purchasing. There are cards I left on the table in there, and I believe you got them all in your packets. I sent them to Richard in advance. You can go online for as little as $36. You can buy a bond for a bar mitzvah, a birthday, a new grandchild, a graduation, and going right up the ladder. If you're interested in your long-term care and your long-term investments, you can buy bonds for your IRAs, your pension funds. Some of you have businesses, you have pension funds. We have pension funds, personal pension funds invested in Israel bonds. We have states, the state of Massachusetts invested in Israel bonds. The state of Ohio, anybody venture to guess how much they just purchased in Israel bonds? Can you tell them? $42 million. $42 million, the state of Ohio said was a good investment in Israel bonds. So we do run all ends of, of the spectrum. Family endowments. We have small family endowments. We have larger family endowments. We've heard <coughs> about protecting assets. I had somebody approach me earlier. I don't think he's in the room right now, saying he's just gone through some life um, situations. He works with a colleague of mine in New Jersey and to let her know that he's gonna call her, they have a family endowment and they're looking to invest 
significant. Now, significant to what's happening at UBS, where people make multi-million dollar investments, is not the same significant as Israel bonds. But you know what? Every dollar counts. And the state of Israel has succeeded because of the investment capital raised through Israel bonds. There's actually a sign in Ben Gurion Airport. Thank you to the state of Israel bonds for your investment dollars. The roads that weren't there in 1951, the high-speed rail, the ports, the water desalinization, all help, all with the aid of Israel bonds. Now, we do go, all the money goes into the Treasury. I can't sit here and tell you X number of dollars were allocated to what project. But I can tell you that those $35 billion, the check gets written to the State of Israel. I do not work on commissions. None of us work on commission. We're straight salaried employees. And our job is just to raise the capital. There is one other program that we have. It's a fairly new program. It's not quite the same as an investment. It's called our Israel Bond Financing Program. And I brought flyers for this as well. Basically, the way I like to describe it is it's a way to make a very large, one minute, large imprint with a small capital outlay. Just to give you an example, you're not, you buy a $100,000 bond, a straight purchase, you pay $100,000, you're lending Israel $100,000, you're getting interest at the end of the term, you get your $100,000 back. Bond financing, you're lending the money for the bank to buy a $100,000 bond and you're paying an interest cost. So just to give you an example, a $100,000 two-year LIBOR floating bond, your estimated two-year cost is $1,600. They require $2,500 out of pocket. So for a $2,500 outlay, of which you'll get $900 back after two years, you're allowing Israel to have the use of a $100,000 bond, which is an incredible program. We've had quite a bit of participation. If anybody here wants to commit to doing this, you can have an Israel Bonds coffee mug. And with that, I'm going to turn the program back to Steve. Thank that, you. Is that a personal guarantee on that bank loan thing? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Basically, um, you're on the line. Exactly. I'm, I'm going to say one thing that she didn't say. Most people think of Israel Bonds, which so used to everybody coming up and asking for a donation. Israel Bonds is not a donation. It is an investment. So keep that in mind. Having said that, it's a great, safe investment. And the Mazel Tov uh, bonds are uh, something that you can give at a very affordable price. One year I decided to give them out as Afikoman gifts. And uh, so like you find the Afikoman, you got an Israel Bond. That was, <laughs> that was the idea. So you can apply them. By the way, Many of you are approached by many charities and you make donations. You can buy a bond and Thank give you. them the bond. So you can get a double deal. It's called okay. the double mitzvah program. So keep in mind, always keep in mind when you're going to do something, it's a safe investment. And I know everything I said about uh, the, the, the disclaimer, it's considered a very safe investment. It's a good return. It should be part of your uh, diversified. Uh, that type of investment is good for a diversified uh, portfolio. And at any rate, let us continue with that. And I'm sorry I gave a little bit because I am a member of the Board of Trustees uh, in Pittsburgh for in our, our area for Israel Bonds. So our next speaker is going to talk to us about highlights of Israeli stock funds and Israeli stocks and bonds trading on the U.S. exchanges. And that would be Harvey Albert, who's located here in Boston. He's a senior vice president and senior portfolio manager at RBC Wealth Management. He's worked in the financial service industries for over 30 years. Harvey holds Series 7 and 66 licenses, is a member of RBC Wealth Management's President's Council and Portfolio Focus Program. He holds a law degree from New England School of Law has taught investment courses at University of Lowell. He is a past chairman of the WGBH Corporate Executive Council. He's an impressive guy. Here he is. Let's hear what he has to say. Thank you very much. Thank you. That sounds great. Uh, good morning. Um, you've already heard um, a good bit from, excuse me, from Alice uh, about investing in Israel bonds, uh, which uh, in terms of if you're looking for uh, a real conservative investment and a way to participate in the Israeli economy, Israel bonds, certainly a great way uh, to do that. And um, we heard from Tom some, some other ways to invest. Um, you know, he specifically mentioned uh, uh, private, uh, essentially uh, um, 
what's not a stock trading on an exchange, but a way to invest in multiple companies by <coughs> investing in a uh, private placement type um, of, of a structure. Um, what I'm going to describe is to give you kind of a, an overview of other ways to invest in Israel. <coughs> Excuse me, it's a little bit of a <coughs> of a difficult area. Um, it's not that easy to do. Um, foreign securities, Israeli securities, are foreign securities, um, and many of them may trade just on the Israel exchange. Um, they trade in Israeli currency, um, and it is difficult um, to purchase um, stocks that are trading on Israel, uh, Israeli exchanges here in the U.S. It's difficult because there's, uh, there's currency issues, um, there's also reporting issues. Um, it's also difficult to find a broker that uh, can easily give you the information you need to make purchases directly um, on foreign exchanges, including the Israel exchange. So it's more difficult to get information on these companies here if they're not listed on a, a local exchange in, in the United States. Now, many companies, which you kind of heard, many, uh, many Israeli companies do trade um, in the United States on our exchanges, and they typically trade as uh, what's called ADRs, which are American Depository Receipts. So that's the way that you're able to purchase shares of Israeli companies here on U.S. exchanges. Um, I'm going to describe to you uh, the few because it doesn't seem that there's that many ways to participate other than individual securities, um, other ways to participate in uh, the, the Israeli uh, equity markets. Now, there are a lot of individual securities, as you've already heard mentioned, that do trade as ADRs on uh, our U.S. exchanges. Um, some of some names you've heard, obviously very familiar, uh, Teva, uh, Amdocs, Checkpoint Software, a number of the banks, um, Verifone Systems. So there, there's, there's uh, ways to participate in a number of individual securities, and there's many more. Uh, I was asked not to go into um, a lot of individual security um, recommendations, but there are, there are quite a number of, um, of Israeli companies trading as ADRs on U.S. exchanges. Um, the, there are only, um, that I have really been able to find, only a few um, ways to participate in a, in a broader way in the Israeli uh, markets, in the Israeli stock markets. So I'm just going to describe to you um, <coughs> those um, that I have uh, a little bit of familiarity with. Um, there is, there are a number of different um, a number of different uh, structured vehicles uh, that own other securities. So mutual funds, um, I'm probably most of you are familiar with mutual funds. There's also closed-end funds, and there's also uh, exchange-traded funds, ETFs. So um, there's a little bit of all of these available here in the U.S. that represent uh, Israeli-based, primarily, investments. Um, so one of them is a closed-end fund uh, called Aberdeen, and that's a professionally managed um, fund where you have managers that pick, pick from Israeli stocks, essentially, and put them into a portfolio. You can buy something like that on New York, on a, on a U.S. exchange, on the New York exchange, as a closed-end fund, which represents many different stocks primarily based as Israel companies. So um, uh, that's, that's something, again, you purchase just like a regular share on the, on the exchange, operates as a closed-end fund. Uh, right now, it sells at a discount to its net asset value. Over the years, it's done pretty well. Um, but it's going to have a representative package of Israeli stocks in there. So that's essentially one way to get you know, with diversified, if you're not going to try to pick the individual stocks, um, to get a, um, to get a <coughs> representation and a, a package of, of, of Israeli companies. The second would be um, <coughs> there is an ETF, which is an exchange-traded fund. Uh, exchange-traded funds is, are any of you familiar with exchange-traded funds? Anybody? Yes. Okay. Trade like stocks. 
trade like yeah. stocks on the exchange, they're basically low, they tend to be lower cost, passively, um, passively managed. So it's not as though you get typically an active manager that buys themselves and picks lots of different things for you on an ongoing basis. It's typically set up as one group of securities that's kept in a portfolio. So you get to buy in, they've been selected, these are all selected because they're Israeli-based companies, and they're put into this what's called exchange-traded fund. You can buy it, purchase it like a regular stock on the uh, U.S. exchange. Um, this particular ETF is called Israel ETF, and like I said, it, it trades here. Um, and you can buy that and get representation now. It has about 85 holdings, um, primarily Israeli, um, <coughs> all Israeli um, companies What's in, that symbol? in their portfolio. The symbol is ISRA. So that's called Israel ETF. And it doesn't have a lot of money in it, uh, but, um, but again, it's a representation of uh, 89 different uh, Israeli-based Companies is that, and is that not 20 million? What, what's yeah, that? I think it's really small, like 25 million bucks. Uh, very small, but it is a way to participate in more than just an individual company getting a you know a package. And what's the symbol for Aberdeen? Aberdeen is um, uh, ISL. The uh, the other way uh, that I've uh, found uh, really located. I'm not, it's not something that I purchased uh, for clients uh, because I don't think they have distribution uh, availability here through, uh, through other firms. I think they're only doing self-distribution. It's a mutual fund, Israel-based mutual fund. It's called Am Amadex 35 um, and it's a basically a, a, a standard type of a mutual fund but it's all Israeli companies. So that has more active management, diversified portfolio, active management, um, and they do their own distribution. Uh, they're based in Willow Grove, Pennsylvania, and um, they have a um, they have a website. Uh, if you look up the Amidex, A M I D E X, you know you'll see their site, and you can see how to contact them and get more information about their uh, their mutual fund. My time is up, but answer any questions I can. All right, I think, thank everybody for coming. Uh, our next part of the program is Box Lunch with Brett Aaron.